Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Congratulations for staying for this last keynote and for making it through the stretch. Um, as I said, or as was said about me, I'm an artist and a speculative designer, critical designer, and my work comes from a place of uh, interrogation. And I want us to all take a step back. You've, uh, you're probably full of inspiration and excitement and have tools in your pockets now, hopefully, and insights gained. But I want us to take a step back and hopefully send you off with some thoughts to consider about the work you do, about why you're building what you build, and about the future as well and the present. Obviously, we've seen a lot of good examples, but I want you to think about this again, move your, remove yourself from being in your projects and being with the technologies. We're gonna take a look at what impacts these technologies are having. Some of my favorite examples are things like, what can help me work less but better? We've seen yesterday, how can we treat ourselves, make us healthier, prevent diseases earlier through machine learning and AI? How can we keep ourselves safe and our inhabitants through, this is a project not presented here, it's about tracking to stop poachers. One of my favorite examples is how can we make technology help us be more compassionate? This is embodied labs where they use VR and data collection, and then they make you able to have the experience of the patient or your loved one so they can be better treated and you can understand what their problem is. This is an end of life situation that one can step in. Of course, we are all aware of the negatives um, but some of them have been really coming out to the surface, especially the past couple of years. Control is becoming a problem. With the commercialization of the internet and data commodification, we've seen examples of how democracy can be undermined. For example, we all know Cambridge Analytica was able to influence the elections of Trump and Brexit through the purchase of Facebook ads. Addiction is another problem. Especially, it, it, it hits every age. I don't know if we all feel like we're addicted to technology and to programs. But what's shocking is that some of the people making these are very well aware of that, even though they go every day to their job and they make this product that they know is addictive. Meanwhile, they go to great lengths to keep their children away from it. This I find very irresponsible. We're also worried about the dangers of autonomy. Aut One example last year was Toby Walsh presented his warnings about autonomous weapons called killer robots. And then there's discrimination. So social scientist Virginia Eubanks last year published her book, Automating Inequality. This is about poor and working class Americans not getting the services they need because of data mining, policy um, algorithms, and policing. And a lot of people are really worried about redundancy. I know a lot of you in this room really don't have to worry about that being on the side of data in, in your professions, but a lot of the world is very worried. And it doesn't just affect manual labor. It's affecting an example. It's just a few weeks ago, AI beat top lawyers in interpreting contract laws. And in New York, you're, we're getting a lot of suicides from taxi and limousine drivers as there's no regulation or not enough regulation against Uber and Lyft. And they're really feeling the threat of aut autonomous vehicles and platform technologies taking their livelihoods away. Now, I'm here because in 2013, I was studying um, at this program in London called Design Interactions. And I was looking at the ways in which technologies are impacting our lives as society. And I was mostly looking at smartphones and the internet and how they were rewiring our brains and our behaviors. And I come at this from a position of also an artist. I really like visions, and I like to know what the goal was. 
So at this time, my interest and my concern was in inequality, growing economic inequality. And so when Snowden came out with his revelations, everybody kind of shifted their focus to the privacy aspect. And given the concern of the future of work and inequality, I decided to look at who else was collecting this and at that time saw this massive economy booming. I, I think today it was said that it's now, or by 2015 it was in the hundreds of billions. At that time it was only 80 billion, still a lot. But I saw, with my concerns, I saw th an opportunity in this, in that if we're all actively creating data, we are all actively contributing to this economy, so shouldn't we all participate in that as data creators, data providers, not as users, not as consumers, but as an acknowledged data participant? And so I did so at the start because I was very unaware of where the data was coming. So I started it at, the, at this point as an investigation and a protest. And I'm going to let my 2014 self explain. We are all data slaves. I don't know about you, but I've had enough of being exploited. You know who's got it made? Corporations. If companies can make money from my information, information that I generate just by being alive, then so can I. I've decided to play their game, but with a little twist, by bringing the whole process down to the individual by incorporating my identity. What's my solution? Extreme capitalism. I'm now the founder, CEO, shareholder, and product of Jennifer Lynn Marone, Inc. As a corporation, who I am, how I am, and what I do is for me to exploit, making my life, my existence, and the data I generate my business. This is not about everybody getting rich. It's about everybody getting their fair share. Let me explain how this works. I've broken down every aspect of how I am as a human into physical, mental, and biological services. Take a look over here. On my website, people can go to ask to use me. Debates to request are also transparent, so if you ask me to do something dangerous and unethical, you better be prepared to answer why. Shareholders vote on major decisions. Perhaps I'll be used for what I do best. Perhaps it will go terribly wrong. At the same time, I'm capturing and collecting as much data about myself as I possibly can, so I can analyze, package, and sell it as I see fit. I'm using all the same methods of surveillance and data collection that companies and governments do to us now. The only difference is that I'm not interested in your information. I'm only interested in collecting mine. And I'm going to be fully transparent about it all, meaning I'm making it live and public. Why? Because we're that transparent to those watching us now. As I gain control to this, with this exposure, I will become more opaque. I also want to test what's the worst that can happen. If someone steals my identity, I don't stop existing. If everything is happening out in the open, caught on camera, with sensors, every action streamed live, is there still danger? Well, you'll have to watch to find out. This is extreme capitalism. Now, this was in 2014, remember, so at the time I was looking at the ways in which we were putting more of our lives online, I was looking at the ways in which YouTube was starting to flourish with people constantly uh, exposing themselves in different ways, and so that was a reflection of that. What I didn't realize was the corporate ethos or mentality by embodying this, this state. And the reason why I did this, why I chose to become a corporation, was because in the US, corporations are people. And when I looked at who was collecting the data, they were all corporations, which we're very well aware of right now. Gradually, since 2010, with Citizens United in the US, corporations have gained greater and greater rights equal to people. 
the one thing that corporations have that individuals don't have, and this was before the GDPR, and in the US we still have no protections, which might be coming now, but what they had that I wanted was a container that I could use and stick my data in there as intellectual property so that I could go and sue basically everybody in this room if my information was in your database without my consent. But what I found also about adopting this corporate personhood was that there's some things that I, I think are actually maybe useful for us to think about ourselves and the future that we're building or actually even the present. One example is self-governance. Um, that's something where you, you determine your reliance and what you're going to do in the world. Finding a purpose, being useful to others, having a mission, decreasing your consumption and in increasing your production, trying to eliminate waste, and exploit your resources sustainably. I went to an extreme with this because I wanted to make a point and create awareness of the extreme, like I said in the video. It was public for a bit, and then gradually as I gained more control, or I just decided to stop using certain services, like I'm not on Facebook, I have gone back to more of a private life. But one thing I want to point out is or make impress on you is the lack of vision that I see in the world today and the lack of goals that I see. And so I started to think about what kind of world this would look like. And I was trying to do it diagrammatically, and I thought, well, if everybody owns their data, then there's still the market there but we need something in between. So this is an image of, a very basic image of like a platform, a cooperative data broker that everybody could put their, their data through and sell it and then share the profits of. I looked at ways in which from a very basic standpoint, where is data coming from me? And looked at the devices I used at the time. I also packaged up the data, what, as we just heard a couple of talks ago, what information tells a story, or what information gets aggregated and makes it more valuable. Here, it's divided into seven categories, or six categories, character, demographic, lifestyle, digital, identity, financial, and health. And I was trying to show that this is a, an economy where I could maybe passively gain income through my data stream, but I want to be useful to those around me and in my, in my community. And ha at the time, we were gamifying a lot of things, so I thought, well, if it's a game and people say, I need you for this or I need you for that, and how do we quantify that transaction? Now, of course, this isn't very practical. It's not um, a protest that can be taken on by many. It's an expensive and all-consuming endeavor. So I do not expect and did not expect that everybody would become a corporation and that we would change things. But I did start questioning what the vision is of companies. What, what is all of your visions as builders of these technologies, of builders of AI, and I think it's actually now a really, really critical time to start asking this. And so I did. I went to some of the biggest technology companies in the world, and I sat down with the research scientists building these technologies, like AI and machine learning, and I asked them, what, what's the goal? What is the vision? What's your, what are you working on, and what's what are you trying to do? Or what does the world look like with your product? And I really didn't get many answers. I either got perplexed, quizzical looks, or I got people that said, I don't know, but it doesn't look good, or that it was a very narrow world around what they're building. And this started to concern me, this absence of a vision. So I'm asking you to think what your vision is especially now that data 
everywhere I heard today, data, make use of it, make it available. Because this vision of a future that you're planning on might not exist for much longer. Some One person's vision in that company was something like this. He said, I think we're going to be traveling around planet to planet or just in space. We've left this one and we live forever and we're hooked up to computers all the time. That sounds very familiar. And that made me think maybe we're only moving towards futures or presents of visions that we're told. E.M. Forster, I don't know if anybody's read this book, The Machine Stops, it was published in 1904. And it tells the story of a society that lives underground, each in their individual rooms. They're connected by um, these kind of televisions, and they each teach each other little things, like insignificant things, um, like putting on makeup or Spanish, or not insignificant, but in this world, not very useful. And this is uh, undeniably close to how we live today. We don't live underground. But what happens in this book is change does come, but then the vision stops. We don't know how things progress after. So we have plenty of dystopias, and we have plenty of fantasy. But what do we have for realistic alternatives to today, or where we're going very soon, not where we're going to be in the future that none of us are going to experience? We have corporate visions. And these companies, and I'm sure many of you, are very, very involved, and it serves to your advantage for us to believe in these visions. Visions of how our environment's going to be augmented with your products or corporate products. Visions of data collection all the time through our retina or living forever and our genomics on this cloud or that cloud. Also, visions that I don't think everybody identifies with. I don't identify with one of these. I do not fly business class. I do not live in the jungle or the rainforest where I can look at architectural plans on um, a, new, a new background, a new device. So the visions are very, sp for s very specific demographics as well. What I want to do now is I want to show you some real examples. Examples because since I haven't been finding them in visions, I have been trying to find them in reality. Recently, when Uber cut the pay cuts to drivers, there were protests in Paris, and some drivers organized and built their own, prog their own application modeled off of Uber. I think a couple of weeks ago, we heard CEO of Airbnb request from the U United States Securities and Exchange Commission to allow his host or hosts of Airbnb, Airbnb to become equity stakeholders. A vision of mine would be going even further and only hosts and guests are equity stakeholders and that shareholders are not something else. Me data is one of I don't know if anybody here knows of them, probably. They're a great example of data ethics, data dignity, and potentially a future that we're headed for, if people like myself have anything to, to do with it. MeData is a cooperative health data bank. It's citizen-owned by all the members that contribute their data. It's not for profit, it's transparent. And what they do is they believe that the people contribute the value, and the value goes back to those people. And since it's a cooperative, all the members decide how they want that profit to be used. So whether it's given back as dividends, or whether it's reinvested, or it goes somewhere else. And they can also decide how they want their data to be used. Here are two people that are visionaries, Jaron Lanier and Glenn Vile, both of whom I've been in well, one, one of them I've been in collaboration with recently. They have started to provide visions about data as labor and data dignity. And last month, they put across a blueprint for a better digital society in which 
they propose seven principles for any mediators of individual data. Some of these principles are fiduciary duty. Like a personal financial advisor, your obligation as a mediator of individual data is to act in the best interest of the data creator. Quality standards, that they're checked and um, the data is not only used, that it's protected basically in differential privacy, that one piece of data is not the same consideration as another when it's sold and that not all data should be sold. Benefit sharing is a very important one, that 70% of the value of the data, the profit that you receive goes back to the data creators. That means you keep only 30%. Right now, it's closer to 10 or 20% that goes back to creating value either in products or services, but 70% of the value goes back. So together, we started to meet up, and this is one thing I want to also um, put in everybody's mind, as was in the pa a panel earlier, about creating communities. Glenn and I met, and we also engaged somebody else called James Felton Keith, and we started a data union. And so we are pushing for those kinds of principles to be applied to companies and any mediators of data. And we also started recently a community that's a movement. And one of, the, one of the ideas, which was presented in this book of Glenn and Eric Posner, is about data as labor. And we're going to have a conference in March to not only create visions, but to try and see what their impacts would be together, not individually. So we're coming together as ar not just artists, and communicators, but also people in government, activists, entrepreneurs and technologists, and academics. And we're going to make examples of this and see what might work. And then when we find ways that work and visions that are good for reducing in inequality, then we're going to try and build them. So as you leave today and you go off to party, I want everybody to try and think and step back occasionally and think about what you're building and think about the positive things that are, of course, going to be there. But also think about the negative things. Uh, a lot of what ha is happening was not intended. And I want you to be careful and wary of when you're following a corporate vision that's based on a profit motive. And I want you to also not be afraid to try different business models and break what you're doing and break rules and fight for, for what you believe in, but to also really work on a vision of what you think the world should be like or what kind of world you would like to live in. And if your product or your services or what you're doing does not fit into the world that you want to live in, then I really please beg of you to stop. If you'd like to talk to me or find out about anything else that I've talked about tonight, the data union or radical exchange, please do, or you could go to these places. And I can be reached at this information in the middle. I'm happy to help you deploy your visions or find your visions. And I hope you had a great conference. Thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs>